Hello everybody, welcome back to another episode of Decoding the Unknown. As always, I'm your host Simon. Welcome, welcome. Katie wrote today's episode. It's the Bermuda Triangle, real danger or sea legends. Uh, I'm pretty sure the Bermuda Triangle is just something that where, at least statistically, it's not actually that much more dangerous and it's just kind of people, anytime a ship sinks there or a plane crashes there, people are like, oh my god, Bermuda Triangle. But the chances of it crashing anywhere else are just about the same. But I'm not sure. That's why there's a video all about it. Written by Katie. Thank you, Katie. I've never read this before. It's all new to me. And then afterwards, Jen, our wonderful video editor, is going to add in some music and some memes and uh, all that sort of goodness. Thank you, everybody. Let's get into it. For me, the Bermuda Triangle has always existed in my mind as something that's really there, a certain patch of the globe where ships, planes, and people go missing in mysterious circumstances. Growing up in Surrey, England, I occasionally wore probably ill-advised Bermuda shorts as a preteen, but never gave the area they were named after much thought. Well, Bermuda's a <laughs> Bermuda is a real place, right? There is a place called Bermuda, and I think it's in the Caribbean. It's a British Overseas Territory. Well, what do you know? Well, you don't even care! It is a real place, and it is... Oh, it's... I guess it's in the Caribbean? I mean... Sort of? It's kind of quite far off the... No, it's too high. It's... Uh... Mm, it's way out in the Atlantic Ocean. I'd say it's about a fifth of the way to Europe from America off the coast of the Carolinas, roughly, at that latitude. Fascinating stuff. It looks quite nice, to be honest. I'd visit Bermuda. This was the early 90s, so think of something geometric and luminous like fresh princewood rock and you'll get the general idea. This was probably then teamed with a global hypercolor t-shirt that I thought was the epitome of cool before hitting puberty, when it was embarrassing that your armpits were a different color to the rest of your shirt. Oh my god, really? I've never heard of these. But that was fashion in the 90s, apparently, everybody. <laughs> different colored armpits. Anyway, getting back to the point, I definitely was aware of the Bermuda Triangle growing up, but without the internet being a thing yet, there really wasn't much cause for me to question it or really think about it too much. The information I did subconsciously glean must have been taken, uh, must have been references taken from films, TV shows, and quite possibly the news. All of which is to say that I never had any particular reason to doubt that the mysterious area was real. Until now. Yep, at the ripe old age of <clears throat> slightly older than your charming host. That's right. <laughs> I find myself taking my first ever deep dive into the mystery of the Bermuda Triangle. And here is what I found. Uh, so, just for me, like, I'll also give my impression as Katie gave hers. In my mind, also, as a kid, growing up in the 90s, no internet, apparently slightly younger than Katie, is... The Bermuda Triangle was a literal triangle somewhere in either South America or the Caribbean to me. Uh, like between three points, obviously. Fairly big area. And for some reason in my mind, there was a giant squid creature that would drag boats down to the bottom of the ocean and also planes somehow down from the air. Obviously, my child brain, because, you know, it's a plane. A giant squid can't just reach up and get it. But that's what was going on. And then later in my life, I assumed the Bermuda Triangle was just a particularly dangerous, stormy area. And then at some point, either I made a video about this or I read about this, and I kind of, I found out that statistically it doesn't actually exist. At least that's what I remember. That's my wonderful history with the Bermuda Triangle. You're welcome, everybody. The Mystery of the Bermuda Triangle the Bermuda Triangle is an area of ocean that has long been connected to mystery. While it's not an official region with definitive boundaries, it's largely agreed to be an area in the Atlantic with three points of the triangle being roughly Miami, Bermuda, and Puerto Rico. That means like it's a weird triangle. It's kind of a long triangle. Ah, uh, no, I guess it could be because... It's sort of a weird, it's a weird shaped triangle. This means it's difficult to calculate how much of an area it covers, but at least it's at least 500,000 square miles or nearly 1.3 million square kilometers. For reference, that's slightly larger than South Africa, but smaller than Alaska. Brilliant. Even going as far back as Christopher Columbus, weird things have been reported happening on board ships that enter this particular area of the Atlantic. These tales have culminated in legends of ships being swallowed by the ocean, boats and planes just vanishing out of existence without even transmitting a distress call, and even extraterrestrial involvement, because, well, it wouldn't be an episode of Decoding the Unknown if it wasn't like, could be aliens, could it? Could be, and ghosts. 
This has led to the Bermuda Triangles of the nickname the Devil's Triangle. Ooh. In reality, there are many documented instances of weird stuff, crashes, and mysterious disappearances inside this fabled triangle, so let's take a look at a few interesting examples. By the way, Simon, I'm pretty sure you've already given your spoiler alert, probably correct opinions about the Bermuda Triangle by this point. <laughs> so. Yes, he did. Katie! Ah, how did you tell? Well, because I've just got such a vast, big brain of knowledge that I just can't help myself, can I? Such a giant, big brain. Uh, so let's just keep it mysterious for now, shall we? We'll get into all the theories later, I promise. Okay, fine. Well, I like these because it's like, let's, you know, it's the ocean. There's obviously been, like, mysterious disappearances and sh**. Let's read about them. Going all the way back to 1492, when he was sailing the ocean blue and... Well, definitely not discovering America for the first time, as we now know. Christopher Columbus wandered into Bermuda Triangle territory. While his original logs and diaries about this event have not survived, transcriptions of them and secondary source material from people who sailed with Columbus absolutely have. On the 15th of September, 1492, this is reported to have happened, quote, and on this night, at the beginning of it, they saw a marvellous branch of fire fall from the sky into the sea, distant from them four or five leagues. Was leagues a real measurement? Because there's that book, the Jules Verne, like 40,000 leagues under the sea. Or something. Is it 40,000? It's a lot of leagues. And I always thought from that title that even though he said leagues, it wasn't actually a definitive form of measurement. Anyway, not important, let's carry on. A couple of weeks later, they reported having seen a small and faint light, like a small wax candle that rose and lifted up. Also around this time, when they were in Bermuda Triangle territory, the crew started having problems with their compasses. They used the North Star to navigate, and a note about Columbus's diary from the 17th of September 1492 states, The pilots took the north, making it, and found that the compasses northwested a full point, and the sailors were fearful and depressed and did not say why. The admiral was aware of this, and he ordered that the north again be marked when dawn came, and they found that the compasses were correct. The cause was that the north star appears to move, and not the compasses. Stars moving around, and strange lights in the sky. This set the tone for the triangle's future reputation, and yes, while we will of course go into some cooler-headed reasoning later on, let's just carry on with the weird stuff first. Yeah, I mean, one thing that the north star doesn't do, I mean, obviously it moves through the north star, that it moves through the sky, but like it doesn't move unpredictably because the earth moves real predictably same for the the north star is the north star alpha centauri that sh doesn't move it's a star i mean of course it moves in like the grand scheme of the universe but not relative to our star much much like noticeably here are a couple of more famous examples of creepy bermuda triangle goings on in 1890 in 1918 the uss cyclops along with 306 passengers and crew and a cargo of manganese or disappeared forever after sailing through the Bermuda Triangle. The ship was an eight-year-old naval supply ship and had been commissioned as a transport ship during the First World War. In March 1918, the Cyclops left Brazil and headed back to Baltimore but was never seen again. The last known communication from the ship was a radio message stating, Well, affair, all well. But after that, nothing. The ship basically vanished off the face of the earth, and not a single trace of it has been found to this day. The deaths of the 306 people on board the Cyclops represents the US Navy's largest loss of life outside of a combat situation. This is totally possible, though. Look, it's 1918. It's, like, it's well over 100 years ago. Um, it was just not that good in the past. Like, even today. What was that Malaysian Airlines flight, like MH17 or whatever, that went missing like 10 years ago? That is just, the, I think they found like one little bit of it. But they never found that plane. And it's a giant plane disappearing in the 21st century. Like, a, a ship just disappearing and sinking back in the day is just like, yeah, it sank, didn't it? They didn't have time to send out a message. And then their lifeboats all got drowned in a storm. It's just, that happens. One of the best known stories about the Bermuda Triangle again involves the US military. On the 5th of December 1945, a group of torpedo bombers, collectively known as Flight 19, took off from Florida. Oh, I've heard of this one for a routine training mission, I, I think. Flying over the Bermuda Triangle, the entire group, which comprised four planes and uh, five planes, sorry, and 14 airmen, disappeared. The last communication from the leader, Lieutenant Charles Taylor, was radioed. We are entering Whitewater. Nothing seems right. We don't know where we are. The water is green. No, white. 
No wreckage from these planes has ever been found, and the official naval report gave its conclusion as cause unknown. Yeah, the Whitewater one. I've, this is definitely one I've heard of. Even more eerily, once the original five bombers had been reported missing, two search planes went out looking for them. One of these planes, a Martin Mariner with 13 people on board, also disappeared. On the 30th of January 1948, a small passenger plane, the Star Tiger, was heading in for a 5 a.m. landing in Bermuda. It never made it. It was heard from at 3.15 a.m. when the plane checked in with a radio operator in Bermuda. After that, nothing more was heard. No distress call was ever sent. The plane, again with 25 people on board, had seemingly just vanished. A huge search and rescue mission was launched following the Star Tiger's failure to arrive, but no trace of the plane was ever found. Yeah, because how big did we say it was? Like a million square kilometers? Like half a million square miles? This alleged Bermuda Triangle, if we're taking those three points, Puerto Rico, Bermuda, and Miami. I mean... It's a big area to search. It's larger than South Africa. And this is a small passenger plane. It's no surprise that they couldn't find it. And that's not in counting, like, counting how deep the ocean is. Isn't the Mariana Trench like around there? It's deep. The ocean's real deep. Deep water is always something that I found really unsettling. I remember being scared of it as a kid. Like, I wasn't scared of the water. I'm a pretty good swimmer. And I'd always be fine. Like, always fine. Shallow water, no problem. But like diving pools, you know, where it's really deep, or the deep end of the swimming pool. I'd be genuinely scared of that as a kid. And even as an adult, I find it like slightly unsettling. Or like, it's just like, ooh, I don't like it being too deep. And it's like, I don't know why. I know I'm not going to drown. But the idea of swimming in the ocean above the Mariana Trench or whatever, where it's just like miles down. Like that, that is some, I don't know why, it's scary. Because there's all sorts of weird shit lurking down there. I don't know. Or even like being on a boat above the Mariana Trench, I'm like, ooh, I don't like that. I don't like that, because you know how far down it is. Weird. And my parents are always like, well, it's just the same as being in shallow water, because you're swimming. You know, it doesn't matter how deep it is. You're swimming on the surface. And I'd be like, that doesn't make me feel any better. I'd look down there in the diving pool and be like, it's really deep. I don't like it. And this this continued for me till I was a teenager, I remember, because I'd go uh, with swimming. We'd go swimming at school, and uh, there was a diving pit. And I'd never want to go, and I'd always be like, I'd never been in the diving pit before because I was afraid. And I joined the swimming club, and we'd all just go diving off the boards. And because, you know, peer pressure or whatever, I must have been like 13 or 14 years old, so I wasn't like a little kid. And I was like, yeah, no worries, I'll just jump off the diving boards. And uh, then I just went in the deep water and I was totally fine because I didn't want to appear to be a coward. What a fascinatingly lengthy tangent, Simon. Let's get back to the uh, video, shall we? The British Aviation Ministry carried out an investigation but came to this puzzling conclusion, quote, In closing this report, it may truly be said that no more baffling problem has ever been presented for investigation. In the complete absence of any reliable evidence as to either the nature or the cause of the accident of the Star Tiger, the court has not been able to do more than suggest possibilities, none of which reaches the level even of probability. What happened in this case will never be known, and the fate of Star Tiger must remain an unsolved mystery. Unsolved mystery. How about it just had an engine failure and crashed in into the ocean and then disappeared into the crushing depths of the Mariana Trench or whatever. That doesn't seem that that is not even a remote possibility. Who is this? The aviation ministry? It seems totally possible to me because you're looking for a, a small craft in an area the size of fucking South Africa. What are you doing? And how about the disappearance of the perhaps appropriately named witchcraft on the 22nd of December 1967? Daniel Burek and his fa friend, Father Padraig Horgan, were in Burek's luxury cabin cruiser, checking out the Christmas lights of Miami from the water. One of the men radioed in to the Coast Guard at 9 p.m. to say that they had hit something and needed a tow, but it wasn't an emergency situation. At this point, the boat was less than a mile out. The Coast Guard reached the witchcraft's supposed location about 20 minutes later, but couldn't find any sign of them. Burek had said that he would let off a flare to show their location, but no flare was seen and no further communications were received. Burek was an experienced sailor with all the necessary safety equipment on board, plus another safety measure of an added flotation device that would mean at least part of the hull would always remain afloat even if it were ruptured or flooded. After a six-day search, the Coast Guard cooled it off with their official verdict given, as they are presumed missing, but not lost at sea. Seems like they're lost at sea. I mean, or maybe they're presumed... No, 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 okay, they just drowned, didn't they? That's what happens. Um, 
This is one of those things, though. This isn't a mystery. In my mind, like, okay, we don't know if it's true, but it seems highly probable that they simply underestimated the scale of the disaster. Like, they'd struck something. They're like, oh, we're leaking a little bit. And then they're like, uh-oh, we're leaking a lot. Oh, my God, we're leaking a lot. And then the ship drowns. Ship drowns. The ship sinks and they drown. Doesn't seem like a big, big mystery to me. There are plenty more cases I could mention, a lot of which involve no distress calls and no wreckage or bodies found, but you're probably getting the idea by now, so let's move on and talk about what could possibly be going on in the Bermuda Triangle. I hope at least a giant squid's mentioned, because otherwise I have no idea why I thought it was a giant squid for most of my childhood. The more off-the-wall explanations as you might expect, a lot of weird theories have been given as to what might be going on in the Bermuda Triangle, so I think this is about the time to talk about how and why it's been given such a spooky reputation. While, as we just found out, strange things seem to have been afoot since the 15th century, the current hype all started back in 1964, which isn't actually that long ago in the grand scheme of things. That was the time the phrase Bermuda Triangle was first coined when American author Vincent Gaddis used it for an article in Argosy magazine. It should be noted that Argosy was what was known as a pulp or pulp fiction mag, which meant that it was cheaply produced publication dealing chiefly in short stories and fictional content. Yeah, yeah. So this is how often, so often this is how these weird things start. Because it's like, it's that weird blending of semi-fact and semi-fiction that sends someone a few years later is like, wow, I read this, it must be true. And then it's like, yeah, but it wasn't. It's sort of a semi-fictional story. The, I imagine like we'll see all these, you know, semi-fictional TV shows. Like right now I'm watching this, eh, it's fairly average. It's a show called Inventing Anna on Netflix about the uh, the fake heiress in New York who was like, I don't know, just, you know, defrauding money or whatever and uh just as people would re watch this in 50 years and be like yeah it's a documentary it's like no not quite while argosy did change focus over the years to add in true crime columns and later grant a bit spicier in the 1960s it was primarily a publication for fiction not investigative journalism it seems that gaddis did like to write about paranormal things and also like to expound on his left field theories with no evidence or thought for more rational explanations hey he's kind of like the opposite of this show <laughs> i mean where would be the fun in that hey to quote from his wikipedia page he was known for inventing mysteries where none existed which spoiler alert seems to sum up the bermuda triangle in a nutshell and also i mean this is just this sort of shit has found a new home on youtube like i one of the reasons i wanted to do this channel is because there is so much just of this like semi pulp like or pulp fiction semi evidence but not really elaborate no research nonsense and it does really well I should have probably just leaned into that if I had no moral compass. He didn't come up with this piece totally on his own, though. He seems to have gained inspiration from a 1952 article in Fate magazine by George X. Sands. This is titled Sea Mystery at Our Back Door and goes on to tell the tale of several disappearances, most of which uh, end up in Gaddis's article 12 years later. Sands doesn't really provide any theories as to what might have happened, just presenting them as mysterious events. He also comes agonizingly close to claiming the name of Bermuda Triangle himself, but just veers off at the last seconds and calls it a watery triangle bounded roughly by Florida, Bermuda, and Puerto Rico. So close, George! You, would, you could have been the next douchiest spokesperson in the world. Gaddis even lifted the title of this article for use in his own piece in the Argosy, which contains the sentence, During the past two decades alone, this sea mystery at our back door has claimed almost a thousand lives. Our sea mystery at our back door I don't think is a unique thing to be like, he stole it! It's like a really odd... Like, if I, if I titled this video, The Sea Mystery at Our Back Door, I'd be like, it's just a good way of calling a thing. I, that's not, that's okay, isn't it? I, shit, I might even call this video the sea mystery at our back door. It's a good title. Anyway, Gaddis's take on said triangle was attention grabbing as he landed the front cover of Argosy with the title The Deadly Bermuda Triangle, Who Will Be Its Next Victim. That's also a good title. <laughs> Although then people will watch the video and be like, oh, nobody, because it's not real. Ah. The cover image is a skull on a red triangle with a black background. All the images I found had a sticker covering some of the subtitle, but it goes on to say UFO, flying saucer, natural phenomenon, then maybe water monster claimed the subscorpion, 10 ships, 12 airplanes, and then a number of people which I couldn't read, but it's probably thousands. This article starts 
What is there about this particular slice of the world that has destroyed hundreds of ships and planes without a trace? I love this just blending of fact and fiction where it's just like, yeah, we'll just make up bits and present it as fact because it's going to sell some magazines. Yeah, yeah. Or it's going to get some clicks on YouTube. This piece is not written as a story. It's written more as an editorial with lots of examples of incidents than is now named Bermuda Triangle, a couple of which we talked about earlier. While steering clear of outright mentioning UFOs or other supernatural phenomena as causes, Gaddis cloaks every incident in mystery and tries to hint at the unlikelihood of rational explanations. He ends the article with the sea guards well her secrets. I don't like people who, what did katie just writes uh i don't like people who try to hint at the unlikeliness uh, unlikelihood of rational explanations because we should always be looking for the rational explanation looking for something irrational is insane it's it's entertaining but if you're trying to do something factual it's insane so Gaddis was taking the idea of unexplained happenings in the area, giving it a good brand name, and sending this idea out into the world. And the next person to grab onto the idea really took it to the next level. Enter Charles Belitz. If the surname sounds familiar, it doesn't. Yes, he was a member of the Belitz family. No idea who they are, who started the language centers. What are those? Am I missing something? Is the Belitz Language Center super famous? He was something of an enthusiast in the realms of the mysterious and was obsessed with the lost city of Atlantis, ancient astronauts, and all that type of stuff. Go on, Simon, have your say, and then I'll just add that I personally think it's extremely fun to dip into all kinds of stuff like that, but it's probably not a great idea to make it your life's work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This is my whole point. Like that ancient astronaut thing, and there's like the the crazy sculpture and stuff where the guy, it looks like an astronaut. For real, looks like a dude who would be walking on the moon. Fun to dip into, fun to analyze, and then move on from quickly when you realize it's nonsense, rather than dedicating your life to this. Because, I mean, look, it's all pointless. Like, let's be realistic. We all live, we all die, no matter what we do. Ultimately, in the grand scheme of things, even like Elon Musk with his electric cars saving the world, all of this, well, big news, you know, he's like, I'm going to get people living on Mars to save humanity. I've got some news, Elon. At some point, humanity's f***ed. Like, at some point, it's going to happen. Either we evolve beyond humanity, best case scenario, and then that future evolution of homo whatever is also f***ed when the universe collapses in on itself at some point in the future. It's all pointless, nihilistic rant over. Wow, how do we get there? Oh, f shit. <laughs> what are we doing? In 1974, Belitz published the best-selling and unoriginally titled book, The Bermuda Triangle, an incredible saga of unexplained disappearances. One of the things he managed to shoehorn into the book was his theory that, yes, Atlantis was located somewhere on the seafloor inside the triangle, and that it had, in fact, been a victim of paranormal forces that are prevalent in the area. This idea was then elaborated by other alternative thinkers to suggest that the Atlanteans were in fact the cause of the disappearances due to the crazy energy crystals they used. Dude, I think I'm addicted to crystal meth. Ah, please. Although I left over when Atlantis sank. It's like, okay, okay. Do you have any evidence to back that up whatsoever? No? No? Shocking. These crystals would mess around with compasses and end up vaporizing boats and planes. Except, no, they wouldn't. What are we talking about? I think these kinds of things are popular because they're entertaining and people are along for the ride and just ingesting the information presented to them without much thought about it either way. That's why the Decoding Unknown show. That's for the discerning viewer or podcast listener. And if you're a discerning podcast listener, I mean, have you considered leaving me a review? I love that. I love those reviews. I see them come in. I like them when they're good, when they're five stars. That's the only type of review you should be leaving. <laughs> no, it's okay. You can leave what you want. It just hurts my feelings. It was quite telling, though, that several reviews of the Burlitz book, Burlitz book mentioned how the readers love it when they were younger, but now thinking about it, they realize that the whole idea had no corroborating factual evidence and just seems, well, completely laughable. So yes, we've now got the name and a strong association with the paranormal read by thousands and thousands of people. In fact, I just looked it up and Berlitz's book sold almost 20 million copies worldwide. Oh my god, I'm wasting my life with a skeptic. I should just be like, Bermuda Triangle, it's f***ing real. Did you enjoy this video? Buy my book on the Bermuda Triangle. Sell 20 million copies and, uh, well, that's a lot of money, isn't it? That's, that's a lot of money.
This book was the seed that spawns the legend of the Bermuda Triangle as we now know it by inspiring movies, TV shows, and more books about the phenomenon. While it might already be clear that we're leaning on the side of skepticism here, what? There are real instances of boats and planes going missing in the Bermuda Triangle, so what might be causing these strange disappearances of aircraft, ships, and possibly entire cities? Entire cities have not gone missing in the Bermuda Triangle, I'm sorry to say. Aliens. It's time to say hi to our extraterrestrial pals. They haven't had much of a look in on the channel recently, but now is their time to shine. Remember Columbus seeing the lights on the water? Well, yes, there's a theory that the lights were from alien spacecraft. This particular example isn't a great one, though. While I gave actual examples of what someone had written about the lights, albeit not Columbus himself. Other sources have stated things like he saw lights shooting up into the sky or stars spinning around. This is not the case and seems to be people taking the notes in his diary completely out of context and interpreting them however they want. These sensationalized and inaccurate examples then got picked up and reused in future pieces about the Bermuda Triangle. So, as we've seen many times before, these alternative facts get attached and embedded into the narrative. Yeah, this is what I was talking about. It's like someone will take something that was semi-fictional and then be like, it's fact. And then someone else will be like, I read about it as fact and it's just the internet's crazy echo chamber we know from as close to a primary source as we can find that columbus did see some lights but it was nothing flying saucer like at all the first instance of a marvelous branch of fire that fell from the sky was more than likely a comet or an asteroid or something cool like that there was no indication given of the crew feeling scared or of further paranormal things happening relating to this event, so I think it's safe to say that it was a one-off. It seems that our friends in flying sources are always on the shortlist when it comes to unexplained disappearances, but as usual, why they would choose to pick up ships and aircraft from this particular piece of the planet is up for debate. We don't seem to have pinned any other disappearances from anywhere else on the seas to them, so well, why here? Maybe they're using a tractor beam to try and raise Atlantis from the depths and these ships and planes happen to get in the path at exactly the wrong time. I don't know if Berlitz came to that conclusion, but hey, it ties together nicely for me and also ridiculously. You might recall that Columbus's voyage did also have issues with navigating as well as seeing those lights. We'll talk more about the compass bearings later, so for now, let's knock this alien theory on the head. Yeah, Columbus wasn't the best at navigation, I guess, because didn't he think for like a long ass time he was like, I am have reached India and he's just hanging out on an island in the Caribbean. <laughs> Other kinds of science fiction stuff. True story. I mentioned to my friend that I was writing a piece in the Bermuda Triangle and their response was, oh, wasn't there that one ship that went missing? Isn't there a hole or something? I replied, a hole? Them. Not in the sea. In the air. Like a black hole. No, me. No. <laughs> Them. What was that? Wasn't there that female pilot that went missing? Me. Do you mean Amelia Earhart? No. <laughs> this is an insane conversation. Katie did. <laughs> One of Katie's friends was like, yeah, I know what causes the Bermuda Triangle. It's a black hole. Mate, if there was a black hole in the sky above Bermuda, do you have any idea how fucked we would be as a planet? It would all be over. It would all be over for our solar system. It would all be over for our, like, galactic neighborhood, having, like, a black hole just consume all of our shit. I was going to direct them to the Amelia Earhart episode of this show, but I'd kind of lost the live to will by then. Anyway, the wormhole slash time portal slash interdimensional black hole theory is, of course, on the list. Do these craft enter some sort of rip in space and then pop out somewhere else? Mm, due to the fact that they've never reappeared in the past or future that we know so far, we can only conclude that no. This is not what is happening. Of course, if the witchcraft or the cyclops suddenly rematerialize, I'd be happy to react, retract this entire section. But I think we're in safe territory here. God, it would be awkward if between now and the time this video goes out, one of these ships that disappeared in the past appears now in the future, with everyone having not aged at all and them saying that it was like, yeah, it was an interdimensional black hole. And aliens, I mean, I guess I'll have to eat my hat. And if that happens, I will literally eat an entire hat. I will. It's not going to happen, though, so don't worry. I'm not worried. Of course I'm worried, and you should be too. There are scenes from the movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where all sorts of things previously abducted by aliens do make a reappearance, but 
Well, that's a movie. It's not real life. There has never been any sort of rift or opening detected in that area at Atlantic, or in fact, anywhere. Or, of course, there's always the possibility of a huge government cover-up about the existence of such a portal, but then they'd probably have manufactured reasons not to travel through that area, and there are currently no restrictions. So yes, again, I'm going to say that this is not a viable theory. It's not in any way whatsoever. It's insane. And you, maybe... I mean, I don't know if you should show this video to your friends, Casey, because that's kind of like... <laughs> really believes this? <laughs> sea monsters. <laughs> oh yeah, we're keeping with the weird stuff. There have been legends about Krakens, Giant Sea... Krakens? Krakens? I always get that one wrong, and I try to remember the correct pronunciation, then I'm never sure if I get it right, and I'm not professional or caring enough to look it up every time. Giant sea snakes, huge tentacled things, and other monsters of the deep since humans first started sailing the oceans. So this is the one from my mind as a kid. That giant sea monster that reaches up and snatches planes out of the sky, which is absurd. Could something be lurking way down in the depths of the Atlantic that occasionally pops up and grabs a tasty boat snack? with a side of human. While we know very little about what goes on in the depths of the sea, it's not that likely that a huge sea creature is the cause of these disappearances. Yes, enormous squid do exist. A 30-foot or 9-meter one was found off the coast of Japan in 2005, and the largest one recorded to date was nearly 43 feet or 13 meters long. This f***ing massive. I guess it's not impossible for an animal of any description to maybe take out a very small boat, but the Cyclops, this was a very large coal ship, the biggest squid in the world, would have no chance, and none of the examples we have given ever gave any sort of distress call. There would be time to mention that a sea monster was attacking before the whole ship went down, surely. And don't forget that some of the most well-known disappearances are aircraft, unless they were skimming the waves, which they were not. I think they should have been high enough to be safe from a monster attack. Unless they were in Mega Shark vs. Giant Octopus, where yes, a Mega Shark does indeed jump out of the water and take out a plane. Don't tell me that's real. There's a movie called Mega Shark vs. Giant Octopus. Oh my god. <laughs> As if we don't have enough to worry about when flying thousands of feet over the planet in a metal tube they go and add shark attacks in. Oh my. You may have guessed that from the tone of this section that sea monsters are not high on my personal list of explanations, but hey, it's a free country unless you're watching this from somewhere that it isn't. So, what, well, you probably can't get YouTube then, can you? Unless you're watching it through your VPN. It'd be great if this episode was sponsored by one of our VPN sponsors. I don't know if it will be, but also, I mean, you're still not in a free country, are you? That's kind of a bummer. VPN doesn't, like, buy you right. It doesn't get you rights. It just gets you access to watch YouTube in a country which has right. But that's close enough. A VPN that starts offering that would be really good. That'd be a unique selling point, VPN companies. Let's move on to some more likely theories, or at least some theories that are based in the real world. Magnetic anomalies. Is there some sort of electromagnetic thing that is happening in the Bermuda Triangle that makes compasses and navigation equipment go haywire? Columbus's men had trouble lining up with the North Star and the pilots of the ill-fated Flight 19 also apparently couldn't work out where they were. I've seen a couple of explanations here. One is that sometimes Magnetic North and True Magnetic North line up in what's called an agonic line. Columbus could have passed through an area like this in the Bermuda Triangle, and this would have changed the readings for Magnetic North related to the North Star, I think. Anyway, to be honest, I got a bit confused here, and it seems to turn out that there shouldn't really be any issues with compasses in this area more than anywhere else. Even if the compass is pointing to True North for a time, as well as Magnetic North, it's also pointed to Magnetic North, so navigating shouldn't be an issue. Columbus also may have been in some rough weather, which caused his rudimentary compass to just spin around a little bit. There aren't no, any known magnetic disturbances or anomalies in the Bermuda Triangle, so I'm thinking this can probably be put down to later writers exaggerating things that weren't a big deal to begin with. Well, isn't the biggest thing of all, like, that there's just not that many more ships going missing in the Bermuda Triangle, so we don't need an explanation. But maybe I'm wrong. I don't think I'm wrong. I'm fairly sure I'm right. Natural weather occurrences. Weather can do weird stuff sometimes. There are things like catabatic winds and ball lightning which have been given as possible and plausible reasons for the events of the Dyatlov Pass, another great Decoding the Unknown episode, by the way. 
definitely check it out. In the ocean, there are sea quakes and water spouts, which, while I'm plugging past episodes, may have had a hand in the mysterious circumstances surrounding the Mary Celeste. Basically, strange things can happen at any given moment, and we're all just hanging on here by the skin of our teeth and the grace of our alien overlords. Yes, it's possible that rogue waves can capsize a boat or a ship that could be taken down by a sudden eruption from the seafloor, or a plane could run into some sort of atmospheric megastorm. But how often is that likely to happen? I've been reining it in this whole time, but now I've come to the rather disappointing conclusion about the Muta Triangle mystery, and that is that... There is no mystery! Ah, boo-hoo, hiss, hiss. We want mystery, you say. We want aliens. We want black holes opening up and swallowing planes whole, only for them to appear at some magical future time. Well, sorry, but you're not going to get any of that stuff off the coast of Puerto Rico. What we've been skirting around this entire time is that while there have been incidents in the so-called Bermuda Triangle, there have been no more than any other routinely traversed area of ocean anywhere else. Yes, thank you. There are no definitive numbers, and I found a huge disparity, but it's estimated for certain that at least 50 ships and 20 planes have disappeared in the area, which is nowhere near the hundreds and pl- hundreds of ships and planes as reported by Vincent Gaddis. Yes, we should all be ignoring Gaddis, because he's a fiction writer. In fact, in 2013, the World Wildlife Fund didn't even place the Bermuda Triangle area in the top 10 most dangerous bodies of water for shipping. Yes, there have been disappearances, but there have been disappearances all over the world with nothing paranormal attached. It was just assumed that the ship sank or the plane crashed, and that's it. And that's what happened to the Bermuda Triangle cases too. Let's go back and look at the ones we talked about at the beginning in slightly greater detail. We've covered Columbus already, and I'll just add that they were voyaging into the unknown and a faraway light going up and down could have been anything. A light in another boat, light from a settlement on land, they had no idea that they were close to, etc, etc. It's literally anything else that is reasonable. Let's revisit the USS Cyclops now with the 306 people on board. That was the, the Navy's biggest disaster that wasn't in wartime, right? This massive ship just disappeared, but there are the deepest trenches in the Atlantic in the area. Okay, I thought so. I'm not sure if it's the Mariana Trench, but it's deep there. The Atlantic Ocean is mega deep. Uh, no trace would have been found from a sea search, obviously, because it's really deep. <laughs> there are lots of other factors that could point to it sinking rather than, for example, being abducted by aliens. It <laughs> it's an absurd sentence. It was potentially overloaded with manganese ore, which, when wet, could turn it into a shifting load that could help unbalance the ship. Add in that one engine was reported as not working, a heavy storm that was documented, and revelations in the years after that those classes of ships had structural issues, and you got the perfect situation for a big old ship to go down. Moving on to Flight 19, or the five planes that went missing. The flight leader was Charles Taylor, and he was the only really experienced pilot among the 14 airmen. He also had a history of getting lost, having ditched into the sea to be rescued at least, tw- at least twice during the war. While the weather started off fine, Taylor managed to get the group lost, and as time went on, the weather got worse and they ran out of fuel. An article I saw on theconversation.com stated that this type of plane could sink in under 45 seconds once it hit the water. Yes. Totally, this can happen really. It was like my example with a boat off Florida or whatever, where it's like we've had a minor problem, and then it very quickly is like, oh sh, this is bigger than we thought, and then your boat is in the Mariana Trench in like 45 seconds, and you're drowning. Brilliant. What is even more sad is that radio communications confirmed that at least one trainee knew which direction they should be flying in, but everyone bowed to Taylor's leadership. Don't point that gun at him. He's an unpaid intern. Yes, the planes have never been found as, again, bad weather and a lack of knowledge as to where they actually were hampered any search. You've got the Gulf Stream passing through the area, so debris and wreckage could be carried far away by the time a search party started looking. The planes are somewhere on the bottom of the sea, waiting to be found. This is the, uh, the, the, the crew bowing down to the captain. It was like some, there's a great book called Black Box Thinking. I might have even mentioned it before on this show, actually, where uh, this guy looks at this whole situation and how many plane accidents have been caused because the captain thinks he knows what's up and the first officer or whoever's spotted a mistake and been like, this is bad. We're really running into trouble. And the captain's been like, don't worry about it. And then the first officer and the plane have literally and the planes literally crash because the first officer wouldn't speak up again because the captain's in charge and then they had to change the culture of aviation because this 
you know there needed to be a way for the captain to be you know forcefully made aware of this is a problem that you are noticing and we're all gonna die the missing martin mariner search plane that went to look for them is also mainly mostly explainable at the time it was flying another ship the ss gaines mills observed an explosion which coincided with the position of the martin mariner at the time so it blew up apparently these planes had a history of gas leaking from their tanks and this could have been ignited in a variety of ways to cause the plane to explode this is actually the most mysterious of all the bermuda triangle examples as what caused the explosion is not known for certain it's been theorized that the phenomenon of st almo's fire might have created the spark but no official cause has been given the star tiger passenger plane also has a plausible reason for vanishing the theory goes that the plane had been flying abnormally low around 2,000 feet due to bad headwinds at their normal flying height of around 20,000 feet the pilots retired and had at least on one previous radio call said that they were 25,000 feet when they meant 2,000. this may have caused them to recalibrate the altimeter incorrectly for example it was dark and they were at the long end of a long flight and did not realize or remember their height on approach to bermuda they began their descent from what they thought was 20,000 feet and basically just flew straight into the ocean no wreckage was found as it was a small plane and could have easily been carried away in rough seas by the time the search started which wasn't for several hours after the last known communication yeah this is entirely possible just an pilot error huge problem much more likely than giant sea scorpions not scorpions um octopus squid octopus squid as with all these cases we can't definitively say for sure what happened as no wreckage has turned up but this is one sad but plausible explanation yes just so much more likely than any of the crazy stuff guys and how about daniel burek father padraig horgan and the missing witchcraft oh my god this was back right this is a long episode i feel like this is a long time ago there are multiple theories here too including that the boat wasn't where they originally thought and a sudden storm then carried them either for even further out from the search area there's also the suggestion though that the whole radio call was faked so burek and horgan could sec- secretly sail off into the holiday sunset together maybe the coast guard even suspected that this has happened as their verdict of they are presumed missing but not lost at sea seems to hint that they thought the boat hadn't sunk that is entirely possible yeah another very reasonable explanation it's like yeah i'm sick of my life i'm just gonna go out on my boat call it a mayday and then just absolutely bomb it away from where i said i sank and uh, everyone will be like oh i guess he sank game over and then you just i don't know <laughs> live on the high seas forever when you really start drilling down there's no mystery around the bermuda triangle at all in fact articles like the one by gaddis in argosy adding cases that happened outside of the theoretical triangle which inflates the figures and don't even entertain alternative possibilities the sub scorpion that's name checked wait there was a scorpion that's name checked on the cover of the argosy didn't even sink anywhere near the bermuda triangle oh there's a submarine called scorpion not a giant sea scorpion I don't even think sea scorpions are a real thing no they're not it didn't sink anywhere near the bermuda triangle it wasn't found it was found a few hundred miles southwest of the azores which is over 2,000 miles 3,200 kilometers from bermuda that's really far as you can see from the way i originally presented the stories many pertinent bits of information are intentionally left out to preserve the air of mystery when most things come down to just human error or bad luck for many decades and statistical irrelevance just statistically it's just not that there's no difference for many decades there have been ships and aircrafts traveling through the area on a daily basis and apart from a few accidents that we've mentioned nothing untoward ever happens and going back to the article i found on the conversation.com which was in answer to a question asked by a child i found this quote that also underlines why there is no real mystery in fact from the mid 1940s to the mid 1980s more small planes have crashed over the u.s mainland than in the bermuda triangle but because they crashed on land where the wreckage was found they were not considered mysterious exactly beautiful succinct that's the reason it's that there's no mystery i'm so sorry see you ruined it yeah <laughs> In 1975, writer Larry Kush published a book called The Bermuda Triangle Mystery Solved after much research and actual gathering of, well, facts. He concluded that previous writers had exaggerated, misinterpreted, and sometimes just made up information in relation to events happening in the Bermuda Triangle area. Larry, you sound like a legend. So there you are. After knowing very little about it, I feel that this may be the first time I can say that the unknown has been decoded. For me at least i'm sure most of you reached this conclusion a very long time ago uh, maybe maybe for me it was even before this episode started <laughs> so happy travels and don't worry about accidentally entering a different dimension if you're headed to bermuda but maybe keep an eye out 
for those mega sharks. This has been an episode of Decoding the Unknown. Thank you so much for watching. What was that episode? The Dialogue Pass one. If you enjoyed this one and you're watching on YouTube, yeah, I'm going to put a little link to that video on the screen so you can click it, go check it out. It was an early video. Shows changed quite a lot since then. I mean, maybe it has. I don't know. I feel like everything I do gets better with time, and then when I watch anything I made in the past, I'm always like, ooh, cringe. Even if it's like a year ago, I'm like, ooh, ooh, not so hot, whistle. Um, anyway, this has been an episode. Thank you so much for watching. If you're listening as a podcast, please leave a review, and I'll see you next time.